A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to Hindu Newspaper Analysis brought to you by Shankar A.S. Academy for the date 30 March 2022. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Without any delay, let's get into the article discussion. See this news article here. It is an editorial article and it talks about the strengthening of the natural platform BIMSTIC. See, BIMSTEC is a grouping that has potential for development and cooperation in a rapidly changing Indo-Pacific region. See, BIMSTEC is the short form of Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multisectoral, Technical and Economic Cooperation. The fifth BIMSTEC summit will be hosted by Sri Lanka in virtual hybrid mode today. And note that this is the silver jubilee of BIMSTEC. So, in this context, let us learn the points that are discussed by the author in bridging the BIMSTEC leaders to reinforce their commitments. And we'll also see what all should be done to reinforce the momentum of collaborations in the Bay of Bengal region for the security and development of all. But before that, the syllabus relevant to the article is given here for your reference. Please go through it. See, before we start our discussion, I want you to take a look at the questions here. See, the first question is asked in the year 2017. The question is, what are the main functions of United Nations Economic and Social Council? Explain the different functional commissions attached to it. And the second question is asked in the year 2016 and it says, increasing cross-border terrorist attacks in India and growing interference in the internal affairs of member states by Pakistan are not conducive for the future of SARC. SARC here is South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. Explain with suitable examples. Now you may be confused. We have taken an article which is related to BIMSTEC. Where are we seeing questions regarding United Nations Economic and Social Council and SARC? See, these are all the examples I wanted to show you because these are all organizations, right? Here, United Nations Economic and Social Council is a global organization. And here, SARC is a regional organization. See, BIMSTEC is also a regional organization. So, you may expect such questions in your GS paper too. And that's exactly why I gave you the questions here. So that the points that we are going to discuss in this editorial will be helpful for your mains preparation. And it can enrich your mains answer. So, pay close attention. Now, let's start our discussion. Let's see a brief note on BIMSTEC now. See, BIMSTEC, like I said, is an abbreviation of Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multisectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation. It is a regional organization comprising seven member states. Who are they? Five from South Asia, which includes Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal and Sri Lanka. And two from the Southeast Asia, which includes Myanmar and Thailand. See, we saw fifth summit of BIMSTEC is going to happen today, right? So now we'll see what are all the area of interest of BIMSTEC that is going to be highlighted in this fifth summit. The first is finalization of BIMSTEC charter. See at the fourth BIMSTEC summit, a task was assigned to the BIMSTEC secretariat. Note that the fourth BIMSTEC summit was held in Nepal in the year 2018. The task was to prepare a preliminary draft of the charter for BIMSTEC. And this is to define a long-term vision and priorities for the cooperation of the BIMSTEC countries. So, this is the first area of interest. So, in this fifth summit, they are going to finalize the charter. The second one is BIMSTEC master plans for transport connectivity. See, it is a comprehensive 10-year strategy and action plan that is from 2018 to 2028. And it is supported by Asian Development Bank, ADB. See, it is for improving the sub-region's transport linkages covering the following areas. Let's see what are those areas. The first one is roads and road transport, railways and rail transport, ports and maritime transport, inland water transport, civil aviation and airports development, multimodal and intermodal transport, trade facilitation, human resource development in the connectivity sector. See, this plan for the transport connectivity is for regional cooperation and integration to accelerate the economic growth and social development. See, a well-established transport network is required for yielding more benefits from a free trade area, including the promotion of trade and investment. It also helps in the progress of other areas of cooperation such as tourism, people-to-people -people contact and cultural exchange. 
So these are all the significance of the transport connectivity plan. Now let's move on to the third area of interest which is BIMSTEC Convention on Mutual Legal Assistance in Criminal Matters. See this convention includes the provision for taking measures to locate, freeze and forfeit or confiscate any funds or finances meant for the financing of all criminal acts in the territory of either party. That is the countries that are all the members of BIMSTEC. Now the fourth one is BIMSTEC Technology Transfer Facility that is the TTF. This is mainly to encourage technology transfer and exchange of experiences among the members of BIMSTEC. And the fifth area of interest is cooperation between diplomatic academies training institutions. And the last area of interest is the template of memorandum of association. See, this is for the future establishment of BIMSTEC centers or entities which present signs of optimism. And it is also for the comeback of the Bay of Bengal as a new economic and strategic space. Having seen the current areas of interest of BIMSTEC, now let us understand the growing value of BIMSTEC through three key reasons. See, the first reason is BIMSTEC has the potential to become the epicenter of Indo-Pacific region. This is because it has geographical contiguity, abundant natural and human resources, and rich historical linkages and a cultural heritage. See, these are all important for promoting deeper cooperation in the Bay of Bengal region. There has been tangible progress in BIMSTEC cooperation in several areas that include security, counter-terrorism, intelligence sharing, cyber security, coastal security and transport connectivity, tourism, etc. Note that this Indo-Pacific region is a place where the interest of major powers of the East and South Asia intersect. So BIMSTEC as an organization of the Bay of Bengal has tremendous value in the Indo-Pacific region because of the reasons that we discussed now. Now moving on to the second reason, see BIMSTEC serves as a bridge between two major high growth centers of Asia which is South and Southeast Asia. See this is essential to develop a peaceful, prosperous and sustainable Bay of Bengal region and this can be achieved by BIMSTEC Master Plan for Transport Connectivity. We saw this Master Plan for Transport Connectivity in the area of interest, right? So this Transport Connectivity Plan can serve as a bridge between South and Southeast Asia. Now the third reason is BIMSTEC Secretariat coordinates, monitors and facilitates the implementation of BIMSTEC activities and programs. So, approval of a BIMSTEC charter during this fifth summit will further augment its visibility and stature in the international fora. So, the BIMSTEC Secretariat will become an establishment of global importance. So, from these three reasons, we know that BIMSTEC is an organization having growing value in the Bay of Bengal region and also in the global arena. Now let us see why BIMSTEC is significant to India in particular. See, BIMSTEC as an organization allows India to pursue three core policies, which is neighborhood first, act east policy and economic development of India's northeastern states. See, neighborhood first policy becomes relevant because it gives primary importance to the country's immediate periphery, that is the neighboring countries. See, we saw the members of BIMSTEC, right? We'll try to recall it now. Who are all the members? They include Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Thailand. Take a moment and think here, who are they? They are the neighbors of India, right? Except for Thailand. So, this neighborhood first policy becomes relevant here. Now the Act East policy. This policy helps India to get connected with the Southeast Asia. Again, Myanmar, Thailand are countries in the Southeast Asia, right? Apart from these two countries, India is working on establishing a friendly relationship with all the other Southeast Asian countries. So here also BIMSTEC helps India to establish diplomatic relation with Myanmar and Thailand. And thirdly, economic development of India's northeastern states. See, this will come true by linking the northeastern states to the Bay of Bengal region via Bangladesh and Myanmar. So, this is how the organization BIMSTEC is significant to India.
Now the second significance, see it allows India to counter China's influence in countries around the Bay of Bengal region. How is China's influence increasing? Due to the spread of its Belt and Road Initiative. So the Beamstick organization helps India to counter the China's presence in these countries. And the next one is, this serves as a platform for India to engage with its neighbours. This is relevant here because South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation is becoming dysfunctional because of the differences between India and Pakistan. So, BIMSTEC is the ray of hope for India for this particular reason. And that is all regarding this article discussion. Now, we will have a quick recap. We saw a brief note about BIMSTEC. We saw the members which include Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Myanmar and Thailand. And after that, we saw the area of interest that are going to be highlighted in 5th summit, which is the finalization of BIMSTEC Charter, BIMSTEC Master Plans for Transport Connectivity, BIMSTEC Convention on Mutual Legal Assistance in Criminal Matters, BIMSTEC Technology Transfer Facility, TTF, cooperation between diplomatic academies, diplomatic training institutions and the Memorandum of Association. And after that, we saw the growing significance of BIMSTEC in the Bay of Bengal region. See, it serves as the epicenter of Indo-Pacific region. It serves as the bridge between two major growth centers of Asia, which is the South and Southeast Asia and BIMSTEC Secretariat gaining significance in the global arena. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing the significance of BIMSTEC to India, which is it allows India to pursue neighborhood first policy, act east policy and it helps in the economic development of India's northeastern states. And it helps India to counter China's influence in the Bay of Bengal region countries. And it serves as a platform for India to engage with its neighbours, with the SARC becoming dysfunctional. With these points in mind, let's move on to the next article discussion. Look at this news article here. The article states that the population of the Greater One Horn Rhino in the Kaziranga National Park and Tiger Reserve has increased by 200 in the four years. See, the recent census was conducted from March 25th to 28th. 50 elephants, 125 enumerators and independent observers, 252 frontline staff were involved in the exercise. The census estimated that 2,613 rhinos, which indicates an annual increase of 50 rhinos since 2018. The last rhino census conducted in 2018 had put the number at 2,413. This recent census is significant because it involved the use of drones for the first time. And this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us discuss about one horned rhino in prelims point of view. See, the greater one horned rhino or the Indian rhino is the largest of the rhino species. It is found only in the Indian subcontinent. Once it was widespread across the entire northern part of the Indian subcontinent. But now, rhino's population has gone down as they were hunted for sport or killed as agricultural pests. This pushed the species very close to extinction and by the start of the 20th century, where only 200 wild greater one-horned rhinos were remained. The recovery of the greater one-horned rhino is among the greatest conservation success stories in Asia. Thanks to the strict protection and management from Indian and Nepalese wildlife authorities, the greater one-horned rhino was brought back from the extinction brink. Today, the population have increased to around 3,700 rhinos in the northeastern India and the Terai grasslands of Nepal. The greater one-horned rhino is identified by a single black horn about 8 to 25 inches long and a grey-brown hide with skin folds. It gives rhinos an armor-plated appearance. The species is solitary except when adult males nearing adulthood gather at the wallows or to graze. See, they primarily graze with the diet consisting almost entirely of grasses as well as leaves, branches of shrubs and trees, fruits and aquatic plants. And that's it about the characteristics of the one-horned rhino. Now let's see the habitat. See, it includes tropical, subtropical grasslands, savannas and scrubland and the preferred habitat of an Indian rhino is the alluvial food plains and areas containing tall grasslands along the foothills of Himalayas. 
Indian rhinoceros were extensively distributed in the Gangetic Plains. Today, the species is restricted to a small habitat in Indo-Nepal Terai and Northern West Bengal and Assam. In India, rhinos are mainly found in Kaziranga National Park, Pobitara Wildlife Sanctuary, Orang National Park, Manas National Park in Assam, Jaldapara National Park, Garumara National Park in West Bengal and Dudwa Tiger Reserve in Uttar Pradesh. Some of the threats for rhinos includes habitat loss, agricultural expansion, human settlements and more importantly poaching. See, Asian rhinos mainly survive in isolated areas in small populations that are at greater risk from inbreeding, natural disasters and disease. So, these are all the threats. See, the most important point from Prelim's perspective is to know about the conservation status of any species. On that note, we are going to see the conservation status of one-horned rhinos. See, the IUCN status of one-horned rhinos is vulnerable. It is also protected under Appendix 1 of Sites and it is listed in Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. And that is all regarding one-horned rhinos. Now, let's have a quick recap. We saw about the population of rhino in the earlier times and in the present scenario. We saw that the population have increased to around 3,700 rhinos in northeastern India and the Terai grasslands of Nepal. And we saw the physical characteristics of one horned rhino which is identified by single black horn and a grey brown hide with skin folds. Hide means skin here. And we saw that it has a diet which consists of grass, leaves, branches of shrubs and trees, fruits and aquatic plants. And after that we saw the habitat which includes tropical, subtropical grassland, savannas and scrubland. And we saw some of the national parks and wildlife sanctuaries where the Indian rhinos are present. And finally we ended our discussion by seeing some of the threats which include habitat loss, agricultural expansion, human settlements and poaching. And we saw that the IUCN status of one-horned rhino is vulnerable. It is protected under Appendix 1 of Sites, listed in Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. With these points in mind, let's move on to the next article discussion. Look at this news article here. See, this article is with reference to BRICS. It states that leading media groups from the five BRICS countries, that is Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, have started a three-month long training program for the journalists. The program was an initiative of BRICS Media Forum and the article states that this was the first international journalism training program conducted online. And in this context, let us discuss about BRICS in prelims perspective. See, as I said already, BRICS is an acronym for Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. Goldman Sachs, economist Jim O'Neill, coined the term BRIC, B-R-I-C, in the year 2001. He claimed that the four BRIC economies would come to dominate the global economy by 2050. And note here that South Africa was added to the list in the year 2010. The chairmanship of the forum is rotated annually among the members in accordance with the acronym B-R-I-C-S. So, after Brazil, Russia will take the chairmanship and after that India and after that China and after that South Africa. See, the BRICS countries, that is the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, ranked among the world's fastest growing market economies for years. It is because of the low labor cost, favorable demographics and abundant natural resources at a time of a global commodities boom. See, the BRICS aims to deepen, broaden and intensify the relations within the grouping and among the individual countries for more sustainable, equitable and mutually beneficial development. And this approach takes into consideration each member's growth, development and poverty objectives. See, it ensures that the relations are built on respective countries' economic strengths and avoid competition wherever possible. So, this is the aim and purpose of the BRICS. Now, we'll see about the significance. See, we have seen that BRICS is an important grouping bringing together the major emerging economies from the world. It comprises of 41% of the world population, having 24% of the world GDP and over 16% of the world trade. 
See, BRICS countries have been the main engines of global economic growth over the years. And over a period of time, BRIC countries have come together to deliberate on important issues under the three pillars of political and security, economic and financial, and cultural and people-to-people -people exchanges. See, the cooperation among the members is predicated on three levels or tracks of interaction. They are track 1, track 2 and track 3. See, track 1 involves formal diplomatic engagement between the national governments. And track 2 involves engagement through government affiliated institutions, for example, state owned enterprises and business councils. Now, track 3 this involves civil society and people to people engagement. See, this is like a hierarchy. Track 1 involves governments, track 2 involves state affiliated institutions. And track 3, civil society and people to people engagement. And this is the significance and functioning. Now let's see some of the facts related to BRICS. See the first BRICS summit took place in the year 2009 in the Russian Federation. And the sixth BRICS summit hosted by Fortaleza and Brasilia in the year 2014 produced a highly important result. The sites, that is the parties, they signed the agreement on New Development Bank and the treaty for establishment of BRICS contingent reserve arrangement. These institutions possessed a total of $200 billion. See, the new development bank was established with the purpose of mobilizing resources for infrastructure and sustainable development projects in BRICS and other emerging and developing countries. Now, let's see the aim of the new development bank. It aims to strengthen the cooperation among the countries and it will supplement the efforts of the multilateral and regional financial institutions for global development. So overall, it contributes to the collective commitments for achieving the goal of strong, sustainable and balanced growth. See, the bank was established with the initial authorized capital of 100 billion US dollars and the headquarters of the bank is located in Shanghai, that is in China. See, the BRICS Contingent Reserve Arrangement, that is the CRA, was also established with an initial size of 100 billion US dollars. This arrangement aims to have a positive precautionary effect. See, it helps countries to tackle short-term liquidity pressures, promote further BRICS cooperation, and it helps to strengthen the global financial safety net and complement existing international arrangements. See, the agreement has the provision of liquidity through currency swaps to avoid the short-term balance of payments pressures. And these are all the outcomes of important BRICS summit. See, the last BRICS summit, that is the 13th BRICS summit, was held under India's chairmanship on September 9, 2021. It was the third time that India hosted BRICS summit after 2012 and 2016. These are all important facts that you have to remember for prelims. And that is all regarding the article discussion. Now let's have a quick recap. We saw about BRICS, which includes countries such as Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. You can easily remember it because the abbreviation is the first letter of the countries. We saw about the aims of BRICS, which is to deepen, broaden, intensify the relations within the grouping and among the individual countries for more sustainable, equitable and mutually beneficial development. And after that, we saw the significance of BRICS. See, it comprises 41% of world population, 24% of world GDP, 16% share in world trade. See, it deliberates on important issues such as politics, security, economic, financial issues, cultural and people-to-people -people exchanges. We saw that the cooperation among the members were in the form of tracks, which involves track 1, track 2, track 3. Track 1 is engagement between the government. Track 2 is engagement through government affiliated institutions. Track 3 is civil society, people to people engagement. And we saw some facts about the BRICS summit. And after that, we saw about New Development Bank, its aim, which is to strengthen the cooperation among countries and to contribute to the collective commitment for achieving strong, sustainable, balanced growth. We saw that the headquarters of the bank is in Shanghai and it was established with an authorized capital of 100 billion US dollars. 
and after that we saw about the contingent reserve arrangement which aims to have a positive precautionary effect from the short term liquidity pressures etc we saw that india hosted the brics summit three times the first one is in the year 2012 and the second one is in the year 2016 and the third one is in the year 2021 which is the 13th brics summit and with these points in mind now let's move on to the next article discussion look at this final article here see this article is with reference to heat waves the article states that indian meteorological department has issued a heat wave warning across telangana the warning was issued as day temperatures slowly rose up to 40 degrees celsius so in this context we'll discuss about heat waves and its effects see a heat wave is a period of abnormally high temperatures heat waves have more than the normal maximum temperature that occurs during the summer season heat waves typically occur between march and june and in some rare cases even extend till july the extreme temperatures and the resultant atmospheric conditions adversely affect people as they cause physiological stresses sometimes resulting in death so this is what a heat wave is it is nothing but temperature increasing abnormally during the summer season see the indian meteorological department has given the following criteria for heat waves the first one is heat wave is considered if maximum temperature of a station reaches at least 40 degree celsius or more for plains and at least 30 degree celsius or more for hilly areas so the criteria is different for plains and hilly areas for plains it is 40 degree celsius or more for hilly areas it is 30 degree celsius or more see the second criteria is based on the departure from normal temperature see the heat wave is declared when departure from normal is 4.5 degree celsius to 6.4 degree celsius and severe heat wave is declared when departure from normal is more than 6.4 degree celsius see what does this departure from normal temperature mean let's say the average temperature of a particular region has been maintained at 32 degree celsius for a long period but now if the temperature has increased to 36.5 degree celsius then it is 4.5 degree celsius departure from normal and that is when the heat wave is declared if the departure from normal is more than 6.4 degree celsius it is severe heat wave see one more criteria is also there it is based on actual maximum temperature see a heat wave is declared when actual maximum temperature is equal to or greater than 45 degree celsius and severe heat wave is declared when actual maximum temperature is equal to or more than 47 degree celsius and the important thing to note here is that to declare a heat wave the above criteria should be at least in two stations in a meteorological subdivision for at least two consecutive days and the heat wave will be declared on the second day see higher daily peak temperatures and more intense heat waves are becoming increasingly frequent and what do you think is the reason here exactly it is because of the climate change india too is feeling the impact of climate change in terms of increased instances of heat waves and heat waves are becoming more intense with each passing year and have a devastating impact on human health thereby increasing the number of heat wave casualties casualties means death we saw a brief note about heat waves and with this basic understanding now we'll see some of the health impacts of heat waves see the health impacts typically involve dehydration heat cramps heat exhaustion or heat stroke now we'll briefly see what these signs and symptoms are the first sign is heat cramp here swelling fainting will be generally accompanied by fever below 39 degree celsius that is 1 or 2 degree fahrenheit the next one is heat exhaustion it includes fatigue weakness dizziness headache nausea vomiting muscle cramps and sweating and then comes the heat stroke See here the body temperature rises to 40 degree celsius that is 1 or 4 degree fahrenheit or more and this comes along with the delirium seizures or coma this is the potential fatal condition and that is all regarding the article here we'll have a quick recap we saw what is a heat wave it is the period of abnormally high temperature during summer season between march and june 
and we saw the criteria given by the Indian Meteorological Department for declaring heat wave. Heat wave is considered if maximum temperature reaches at least 40 degrees Celsius or more for plains, at least 30 degrees Celsius or more for hilly regions. And heat wave is declared when departure from normal temperature is 4.5 degrees Celsius to 6.4 degrees Celsius. Severe heat wave is declared when departure from normal is more than 6.4 degrees Celsius. And based on actual maximum temperature, heat wave is declared when the actual maximum temperature is more than or equal to 45 degrees Celsius and it is equal to or more than 47 degrees Celsius in the case of severe heat wave. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing the health impacts which includes heat cramps, heat exhaustion and heat stroke. With these points in mind, now let us move on to the next part of our discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion. We have three questions today. One of them is a quiz question for you. Now let's proceed with the questions. The first question is, consider the following statements with reference to Indian rhinoceros. Statement 1, it is found only in two states in India. Is this statement correct? We saw in our discussion that rhinos are found in many national parks and wildlife sanctuaries, right? Some of them are Kaziranga, Pobitara, Orang, Manas in Azam, Jaldapara, Garmara in West Bengal, and Dutva in Uttar Pradesh. So the first statement is incorrect. Moving on to the second statement, one horned rhinos are listed as endangered in the IUCN red list and it is yet to be listed under appendix 1 of sites. See the statement is also incorrect. We saw in our discussion that the IUCN status of one horned rhinos is vulnerable and it is already protected under appendix 1 of sites. For your additional information, it is listed in Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. So the correct option here will be option D, neither one nor two. Moving on to the second question, the term contingent reserve arrangement in the context of the affairs of a group of countries is associated with option A, ASEAN, option B, SCO, that is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, option C, BRICS, option D, SARC. Okay, I'll wait a minute for you to figure the answer. Exactly. It is BRICS. We saw in our discussion, right? See, the contingent reserve arrangement was established with the initial size of 100 billion US dollars. This arrangement aims to have a positive precautionary effect. It helps the countries to tackle short-term liquidity pressures and it strengthens the global financial safety net. See, the arrangement has the provision of liquidity through currency swaps to prevent the short-term balance of payments pressures. So, this contingent reserve arrangement is associated with BRICS, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. So, the correct option here is option C. Now, moving on to the last question. See, aspirants, this is the quiz question for you. So, listen carefully. Which of the following statements with reference to heat waves is or are incorrect? You have to find the incorrect statements here. Option A, heat waves typically occur between March and June and in some rare cases even extend till July. Option B, heat wave is considered if maximum temperature of station reaches at least 30 degrees Celsius or more for plains and at least 40 degrees Celsius or more for hilly regions. Option C, Heat waves are exclusive to western parts of India. And option D, both B and C. See, this is a very easy question. Try to recall our discussion and try to attempt this question. And finally, post your answer in the comment section. I have given a mains question for your practice. So, interested aspirants, write it and post it in the comment section. If you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today, post that also in the comment section. And don't forget to attempt the quiz question. And with this, we have come to the end. If you find the video useful, like, share and comment. And do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you.